All right, just do a quick outline uh, of what our plans, uh, of what this will look like. I'm um, just going to describe what it is, going a little bit of the details of the additions kind of made to it, the benefits and, and challenges that we've had with, with this gear, um, some safety things. Um, we do have a little bit of the cost. It, it will be to buy, you know, for a new one as well as just to modify. And then the application, so where this, this uh, gear has been used. Um, so what is it? There's two ways you can kind of view this. It can be viewed as a push trawl that we've just electrified, or an electric fishing boat that we've just added a frame and replaced the dipper. That's nearly what it is, and you just some results in this, where you have the electrified fishing boat and just added a frame to it with an anode system on the front. And that's, that's purely all it is, it's nothing more than that. Um, just to get into kind of the electric fishing settings on it and, and the frame, the additions to it, um, the anode configuration. Most people run two booms, spider arrays typically, um, along the system for your electric fishing boats. When we add on our system, you, we ran it that way. It works fine, we mapped it. We just found that when we centralized those anodes using either a spider or a three wire system that we have, it just purely moves that map in to focus it in front of the frame more. That's, a, that's what we've gained by centralizing the anode system. Um, so it, it's right there in front of the frame, the electrical field is, you don't have a whole lot outside of it. We run a couple different uh, pull, uh, electric fishing settings. Um, we start off with a 30 15, 30 hertz, 15% duty cycle. Um, and then we switch to a 60 hertz, 25% duty cycle. We've measured both of these. We've done a little bit of experiment on which one may be uh, uh, more effective for, for silver carbon themselves. Uh, they're typically about the same. 60 hertz, 25, but slightly better. And a lot of our long-term monitoring programs in the areas that in regions that would work run a 60-25. So we've just gone that way to kind of standardize our, our set. But you can be flexible on that. We do use an AMP goal system for this. Um, it's based off the uh, American Fisheries Society, North American Management of Freshwater Fishes. Um, it's built similar to what the electrofishing boats are in that, in that book itself. Um, so that's just to keep, you know, make sure that we're achieving our, our goals of capturing silver carp, but also not, uh, you know, completely uh, hurting any of the, the rest of the, the system, the fish out there. The cathode on this boat is very typical to an electric fishing boat as well, um, where, where it can be just the boat hull itself on the bottom. However, depending on the material you use for your frame system, you can't even isolate that cathode to just be right here to even more kind of tighten up that map of, of your electrofishing. Um, we use a, a four-stroke uh, Honda generator with a 7,000 surge 500 rated watt generator. I highly recommend these things. They're super quiet. So you save your ears good time. Going into the frame itself, it's, it's a three foot deep, seven foot uh, across frame. Um, it fishes about three feet into the water column itself. It's hooked up to a, a winch system, so it allows us to bring the frame out of the water or lower it into the water. And, and that's been real helpful if you get into shallow situations or debris in the water logs. You can lift the frame out, go around and continue your transit. You have a lot of flexibility in our nets. Our standard net that we've been using is, is a, uh, a three a so three-quarter inch body that goes back into a six millimeter pod. Um, we just kind of standardize that because we're trying to catch a wide range of sizes of silver carp. However, depending on your objectives, that can completely be switched. If you just want big fish, switch it to a larger mesh. If you want to focus on smaller fish, you might switch the whole thing to a smaller mesh. And the type of material you use for this is all dependent on, on the, the objective of your study or the, the preferences. And then finally, we, we've attached safety lines to the frames. Those are these right here coming down from the arms that are attached to the winch itself. Those safety lines just allow you to, we know it was a risk, maybe if, if we're hitting objects or hitting the, the bottom of, of your um, pool. So what this allows you to do is, is these 
breakaways are low strength lines that keep it perpendicular. However, if they do feel a resistance, they will, will break, those lines will break, swinging the frame back and allowing the driver time to put it into neutral and then back out of the situation and keep moving on. You just reattach your safety lines and then move on to a new transect. And those safety lines have worked wonderfully for us in avoiding some tough situations. So we're going to go into kind of the benefits that we've, we've found from, from using electrified dozer trawl. It's really just capitalizing on the benefits of a push trawl system and, and electric fishing. So electric fishing immobilizes the fish, gives us a better opportunity for catching it. With the push trawl, you're just adding a larger catch area and lowers our labor. We're lazy. We want to, we want to lower that dip net be difficult. So it gives us a larger catch area. With the, now we're able to use a big frame system, and then allows us to kind of save on our, our labor using our winches and everything to, to haul up these nets. By combining them, it's given us some flexibility. I already talked about earlier about how we can lift up these frames, this frame out of the water itself, you know, shallow water sampling, or just to avoid any sort of log jam or, or bottom. Um, and also, we can run this with an electric field or without. So it allows you just to actually transfer it back into, into a push trawl system. And the way we've got it designed now, you can actually go right into an electric fishing uh, boat as well. Just take the frame off, put it at the bottom of your boat, move the booms out, add the, add the spider arrays, and you're off. Keep your dip nets and you're, you're ready to roll. You can do it in five minutes on the shore line. But the overall kind of things that we see that this has improved is our sampling effort. It's a reduced our sampling effort that we needed. This is reduced mainly by the large frame, the large catch area that we've added to it. So larger catch area, generally results in a higher catch, reducing your effort needed, as well as it allows our speed to go up. Um, now that we don't have to rely on water clarity or dippers, we're allowed to go a little bit faster than what we normally could do in an electric fishing boat. Like, like David mentioned, all gears have some sort of challenges or bias associated with them. One, bycatch. You no longer can target, target species as well. Um, you will catch bycatch with these frame systems. Um, they, they, that, that cannot, it's hard to avoid. One way that we've tried to limit that though is by limiting our trawl time. So we only do five minute trawls generally for, for our electrified dozer. That just allows us to pull out any bycatch that we are not going after and release them back into the water to keep them safe. Debris. You're getting, you got a frame that's hanging down below. You have to breathe in the system. There's always a back that there's always a chance that you will hit um, and that will hit your frame system. So you have to be aware of where your surroundings when you're running this boat. Conductivity, along with all electric fishing gears, there are limitations that, that are like that too low or too high. Just have to be aware of, of that. The one good thing um, with this, like we said, is you don't need electro fishing sometimes. Conductivity isn't a lot, isn't you aren't capable of running your electro fishing, you can always just use your non you can use it as a push drop. High flow, um, generally you don't want to be in these high flow situations, and that's purely just for the safety factor involved around it. Water depth, um, we do only have one a one meter frame on this, so three feet into the water column. We fish this in up to 13 to 15 feet of water. Felt like our catch rates were fine. Um, our silver carps generally are pelagic up in the water column. So we feel like they're fine, but if you get into those 40 feet of water, 50 feet of water, you're only sampling a little bit of it. So you know you have to be cognizant of, of, of the water depth and what you're actually sampling. And then your size selection. This again goes back to what your nets are. There's no perfect net out there. You're not gonna be able to get the perfect sampling, but Depending on your objectives, you can get what you want. Safety, we've talked a little bit about the safety lines that we've attached to them. Otherwise, it's very similar to electro fishing. We have two shutoff systems, one in the front, one by the driver, uh, and then your weather conditions. You just have to be aware of what your weather conditions are. Speed is always one, flow of the, the water. We talked a little bit about those. Um, and then your winch lines and radio lines on the frame. You just have to be aware of, of, of the condition of those. They will wear down over time. Just be aware of them, change them out when you need. And then your basic boat safety measures. 
So here's some rough costs that we've got. We do this in house. The, the uh, blueprints for this are within our, our office themselves. We are very comfortable in building these. Uh, we've actually had some other agencies do this for their own shop. So it is something you can do. It just depends on how comfortable you are with the electric fishing, um, in my opinion. The, the push draw portion of it is pretty, pretty easy, pretty simple idea. However, we have had the, um, other other agencies have to have them built through through uh, professional electrofishing uh, companies. Uh, Midwest Lake Electrofishing in Kansas City has built one. Um, so I asked them for a few of their costs. Brand new, top to bottom. They said it'd be roughly around one hundred fifty thousand dollars. So that's a pretty steep cost for a brand new one. But the good thing is, is that they will modify an electric fishing boat for you. They said depending on the boat, of course, will will depend on the price, but they can roughly do it in about $35,000. Now, I'm not saying go to Midwest by any means. I'm not promoting them. Any electric fishing company that you can, these, these blueprints are available for everyone. So if you feel comfortable with somebody else, we will give you the blueprints to these. We, we have no preference on where it goes. We will help guide through any any sort of these problems. We just use them because they have built them, and that's it. That's the only reason you have them there. But the designs for all these are the similar design we have in our office, and the, it's can be changed between an electric fishing boat and an electric dozer trawl. So if you can convert it from one to the other, you're not losing the boat. So let's get into kind of the application and how this has been used. We use this in several ways. Um, we use it in the Illinois River for our silver carp population assessments, which I'll go into a little more detail on that one in the next couple slides. We've also used in tributaries in the Missouri River, uh, can, uh, in both the uh, state of Missouri and Kansas. Uh, we use that was for population assessments as well as small fish. And then we've started to move into kind of seeing how, how this could be a support tool for possibilities of, of fish. So we've looked at uh, Silver Lake, it's a refuge lake in Missouri, and this past year we, we used it as a supplemental tool with some of the fish community work going on there. We go into a little more detail in how it was used as a population assessment for silver carp in the Illinois River. Uh, we got our, just to go back in a little bit of detail, our design is a stratified random design. We sampled in both the spring and the fall, and we sit. The habitats we stratified by were backwaters, main channel border, and side channel. We wanted to get an assessment in five pools of the Illinois River, river itself, and through some previous work, we ran a power analysis using that standard method to sample the North American uh, freshwater fish. And we came up, we needed about 50 trawls per pool to get the appropriate relative abundance uh, estimate, and as well as a, a length uh, frequency estimate. And then we ran five minute trawls at 60 hertz, 25% duty cycle, and we go for about three miles per hour. All the fish collected, um, did links and weights on them. Anything that was an Asian carp, we quickly released back into the water. We took age structures and also got sex off the fish. Quick summary of, of the results of that. Uh, Came down to about two to three days per pool we could get 50 trawls done. So we're under anywhere between 18 and 20 trawls uh, per day we could, we could get a, a, a pool assessed. Caught over 2,800 Asian carp, and the majority of those were silver carp with some big heavy carp as well as grass carp in there. We reached all our goals that we had set for our power analysis. Uh, so that's a reduced variation around catch rate as well as enough uh, uh, stock size fish to, to be able to assess the population uh, by the lakes. So with this, just to kind of go really quick with the data that we were trying to collect, we were able to get a whole suite of demographic data resulting in catch rates, con condition, histograms, um, maturity, sex ratio, and ages, which are we're currently working through the ages. But, uh, and we were able to do those assessments from first day of field work until until the data analysis was done was right about two months. So we were able to plot, really go get, go fast on these. The only thing we didn't get was the ages, which we all know takes a little bit more time. But the rest of this we could assess really quick from start date to data analysis. 
And we just got quick data shown on, uh, on this graph, which flows from Alton Pool, these are the pools of the Illinois River, Alton, LaGrange, Peoria, Star Rock, and Marcellus, those are the ones we concentrated, and it was able to give us quick assessments of just the wind frequencies moving up the river. So with that, that's uh, pretty much all I have for that. Again, I'm open to any questions, not only on the electrified dozer trawl, but the potent air as well, and, and we, Emily and Jason are here to help out on, on all those. But feel free, there's some more information on the electrified dozer trawl right here that we, we do have available. Um, but otherwise, I just appreciate being able to come out here and, and talk to you guys about this, and we are definitely open to any questions that you may have, whether it be today, tomorrow, or, or six months from now. So. Go ahead, Dave. So, one of my interests with this is, like I talked about, the variability between who's driving and who's heading. Uh, in terms of comparisons to the traditional uh, uh, electric machine, uh, have, you, have you thought about making comparisons not necessarily in the average category, but the variability. Because I, I think that's key in terms of sampling programs that are, you know, have limited funds and things like that. So we're all thinking about to be able to see a trend, like how, how much sampling would, would uh, be needed. So I'm wondering if you've done any comparisons specifically in the, the you know, how, how variable these gears are relative to other Years and what advantage that might be in terms of bigger picture in, in terms of being able to see trends and things like that. Yep, yep. Um, actually, we, we looked at that. We've drawn a gear comparison between the Tokyo Air, Dose Patrol, and traditional electric fishing um, in a couple backwaters of the Illinois River. Um, when we ran a two year study on those, just, just looking at you know how they stacked up. Um, leak frequencies of of all three of those gears are very similar to one another. And as far as sampling effort, we ran sample sizes similar to the way I presented here with the power analysis for each gear to kind of get at, well, we needed to hit these appropriate bit low variations and lean frequency, enough fish to say we have an assessment. Um, how much, how many samples would we need for each gear? And it roughly comes up to, uh, on those particular backwaters, Traditional electric fishing required uh, roughly, I think it was 10 to 15 more samples than what we, we required on the, the dozer trawl. And then the air was about 10 to 15 samples, even less than the dozer trawl. So yeah, there is the sampling effort on that, that, that we're starting to see. Now our traditional electric fishing that we used, I will say, is Many times people use 15 minute. We only use five minutes because we were trying to standardize everything to a five minute run. So there's there's great sense. So we, we are seeing a less simple effort with these, but as far as data collected, they look pretty similar, which was really nice for us to see because that means we can run, hopefully do some comparisons on these long-term data sets that have used traditional electric fishing. And it's just a correction factor of what so yep, is the 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 effect that you saw with remote gear is that just a function of it being effectively doubling or you know two and a half times the volume of water sampled? Yep. Or is there something else going on there? Yep, it goes back to the frame thing. You got big frames, big catch area, you're gonna catch a lot more fish. Yep. I guess this question goes with remote gear too. If you don't really know what your size structure is going in, mean, you have to fish different meshes. Mesh sizes, you know, that you're getting this balls up or act or efficient gets mixed up. Do you have to consider that going in? Yeah, we we have considered that. Um, we we try to it, it's a hard judgment because once you switch to a small size and these the functionality of the, the recruitment of these silver carbs is always so variable. Right. So you don't know, it, it, you got you have to balance almost a What's available in the small size? What's going to be recruited to the next year? You know, and, and going that route. So that's why we've kind of come up with that design of that three-quarter body, but also we've allowed that six-millimeter mesh caught in the back to catch those small sizes okay. if they're available. Um, it's just that kind of goes to the to both these gears. The, the 
the bias associated with them is those extremes. The extremely big fish may, may be too elusive for them. Um, you know, where, where gill netting may be able to be more productive in, in gathering these huge fish. And the really, really small fish might be more difficult to guess what we're, we're saying is we're getting the heart of that population, that the 80% that falls in that, that, that range in between. And, and again, like I said, it's hard to validate what's actually out there without looking at the sweet years, no approach going into it. And we're trying to, to get to the point to where, well, can we, can we send one year to get, get something that's representative of the several years and try to just slow down the effort as well as keep our silver carbon catch rates up on those. Uh, it'd be really interesting to use what David talked about to compare with the hydroacoustics approach where they can get to those size structures too and, and see what our, our gears can help support that and fall in, in those areas too. So. You said you kind of mapped out the electric field based on the anode and cathode placements. Um, yep. Is that caught in, um, kind of, is it outside of the main part of the electric field? Yep. Because I was kind of thinking like, with traditional electric fishing, ideally the natives want to get in and out of that field quickly, but um, you know, if you're exposing them to that for five minutes straight, have you guys seen any like recovery issues with natives or? Uh, our natives seem to recover really well with that five minutes. Um, we're, our map's back on this. It's such a reduced field in the far back that it doesn't have a strong uh, effect on them uh, to the point where we don't think it's, it doesn't appear to be harming them. Yeah. But we, that's why we want to keep that limited at that five minute because we don't want to go beyond it to see what the result could be down the road. Everything seems to recover. Now, you know, such species, sensitive species as, as shad species and how sensitive they are to electrical fishing, you do see some mortality with those. Yeah. Um, but but your general your buffalo recover really well, crappie bass, all those seem to appear to recover very really well in it. So and I would I would say this the the electrical field is less of a, a concern as if those, if we were to drag them really long in the tow itself, that would just rubbing up against the bed and things and, and getting the mucus and stuff would be more harmful. So that's why we tried to cut that five minute trawl down. Just a comment, I think it would be useful to, you know, when, when you're talking about this, to, to folks that are concerned about costs, I think it would be useful to show what it costs to buy a new electric fishing boat as well. Okay. Um, and and I, I realize it's a different consideration because most of us have those already. So that's not an investment that we need to make, but I do think that sticker shock is is you know substantial, but if you think about it in terms of here's what it would cost relative to the thing that we use all the time, you know maybe it puts it a little bit. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, and these are right off that was right off the assembly line going going to your note boat trailer and everything. So yeah, you're you're right. Yeah, put it in context a little bit. Go ahead, Joseph. We, the, only, the only times that we've really experienced that are low abundance situations. Uh, so let's say in the Missouri River, uh, there, when, there was a high recruit year when we were in the tributaries for small fish. Traditional electro fishing was capable of catching them. Um, we caught them at about five to six times the rate. The small fish, we're talking 150 millimeters and, and below. Uh, we caught about five to six times the rate of theirs. Now in the Illinois River, when we were doing the year kind of comparison, it happened to be two years of low recruitment. So it was hard to tease that out because it was really, according to what we were seeing, none of the years were catching small fish at that point. Uh, but when we were in a high abundance situation where both all the years were sampling these smaller fish, we were, that filter trawl was capturing them about five to six times faster or in greater amounts. So. Anything else? All right. yeah. I would just like to add that we do have handouts. Uh, I put some up there. We started testing around some of the dope control ones. So. I have a question as Dave just walked back again. <laughs> so we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the ability to validate gears and size biases, and I think that it seems to me like a combination of hydroacoustics with, with different gears might help you get at that a little bit. But I also know 
limitations in a small size fish with hyperacoustics. So if your interest is how to catch juveniles, then maybe that's not going to be helpful. Not unless you get a different frequency transducer. We're using 200 kilohertz. I mean, uh, higher frequency ones, like a 420 or something like that, would give you a better idea of smaller fish. But I, I think there's probably better ways to do it. Um, there's definitely still going to be limitations based on background rules and stuff. But it, it wouldn't, I, don't, I don't think it's the best option. Is anybody using it for that purpose? Because it's the it's the one thing that you know 